tiles. They would paint their lips and they would paint their eyes. And uh, the men also would uh, wear a short uh, a loin cloth and they had lovely figures. They had uh, very narrow waists and wide shoulders. I think they were quite, quite good looking. On festival days, enormous crowds would make their way up these steps to watch one of the most unusual athletic events ever staged. They would bring a bull in that they would have been keeping specially for this occasion. There would be boys and girls, acrobats, that would actually jump over the back of the bull. There would be other boys and girls to catch them. Could this dangerous sport recall the legend of boys and girls sacrificed to the Minotaur? Might the monster have been hidden in the dark recesses of this palace along its labyrinthine passages? One thing is certain, Knossos, with its 1,400 rooms, was once the capital of a great power. The magnificent palaces discovered on Crete shared one remarkable trait. None was fortified. These were not a militaristic people. Rather, they seemed to have been cultured and advanced, not unlike the people in Plato's story of Atlantis. The legacy of the Minoans was a love of art, a love of color, perhaps a love of life. Also, the remembrance that once on the island of Crete, there existed a civilization that was peaceful and that had great achievements. Was this the utopian world of lost Atlantis? There are some convincing clues. The bull is a recurring theme in Minoan art. Its many depictions on so many Minoan treasures echo Plato's descriptions of Atlantis. We find the golden cups that Plato described with the bull ceremony engraved on the sides that Plato described in association with those cups and the bulls being tied down by nooses and with rope, which is something that is just totally unique, very distinctly Minoan. Charles Pellegrino has studied the archaeological evidence connecting the Minoans of the Aegean and the people of Plato's Atlantis legend. Early in this century, when the Minoan civilization was first being unearthed, some of the first archaeologists to arrive on the scene looking at the paintings of the bull ceremonies and so on said, that's Plato, that's his Atlantis story. But unlike Atlantis, Crete did not disappear into the sea in a single night. Not far from Knossos, just across the Aegean, lies the island of Santorini, now a popular resort. Its houses perch on a rim of volcanic rock. This is the island once known as Thera, the island destroyed in one devastating eruption 3,000 years ago. When that explosion occurred, the Minoan Empire was at its height. Could that civilization have extended to Thera? Could this be the civilization that disappeared in a single night? Some fascinating new evidence has revealed this was no ordinary eruption. The disaster on Thera was the greatest natural explosion the world has ever seen. Try to imagine a nest of about 150 hydrogen bombs all going off in the same place in about the space of a hiccup. Immediately after the explosion, you would have had a hole about eight miles wide and perhaps a mile or so deep. And the entire Mediterranean trying to fill that hole very quickly. For a period, you would have had waterfalls that would have put Niagara Falls forever to shame. The Queen Elizabeth II going over the edge of that waterfall would have looked like a little twig going over the edge of Niagara. The, it was just a tremendous explosion. Human beings haven't seen or heard anything like that before or since. 
The eruption caused a tidal wave that reached 30 miles inland along the shores of the Aegean. The wave uh, would have reached heights of about 800 feet. If you try to imagine a wave that reaches just about halfway up the Empire State Building. The blast itself must have been felt continents away. Forensic science and ancient records make it possible to pinpoint 1628 BC as the year it struck, sending a dense cloud of ash across the Middle East and around the world. For nine days, no one could see the face of his fellow. The sun is covered and does not shine in the sight of men. If only it would shine even for one hour, no one knows when it is midday. One shadow is not discernible. The sun in the heavens resembles the moon. Those words of an Egyptian scribe recall biblical descriptions of darkness covering the earth. There is evidence of the precise year the ash cloud reached China. In the 29th year of King Jay, the sun was dimmed. Ice formed in the summer mornings and frost in the six months. Heaven rain toppled buildings and temples. The five cereal crops withered and died. There are even indications the cloud reached North America, turning day into night, summer into winter. In California, the core of a 5,000-year-old bristlecone pine shows a ring of dark cells dating back to the same year. When we go back to the year 1628 BC, we find these freeze scars in the California bristle cones. We find Theron ash on the Nile that can be also traced like a fingerprint. And in the Greenland ice cap, where each year of snow builds up, again giving us a kind of fingerprint through time, we can drill down into a glacier, and within seven years of 1628 BC, the sulfur and the ash that can be traced right back to the explosion of Thera. The Thera explosion was so enormous, it became folklore to the Egyptians and was passed down to Plato as the story of Atlantis. But even more fascinating evidence would be revealed on Thera. The ash-covered ruins of an ancient city would draw another brilliant historical detective into the story. In 1967, Spiridon Marinatos began a search for Minoan remains with no idea what he would find beneath the volcanic ash. He first uncovered signs of walls, then a whole street, then dozens of giant storage jars, many filled with produce, as if waiting for their owners to return. There were no bodies, no gold, no jewels. But what Marinatos and his team did discover was far more astonishing. With great care, they began uncovering exquisite frescoes. In the 20th century, paintings wonderfully preserved for 3,000 years in a tomb of ash were revealing a picture of life in this long forgotten town. Many rooms had frescoes on every wall. Here, Marinatos found an elegant, rocky landscape with graceful lilies and playful swallows, swallows that have never returned to the island of Thera. We find frescoes in every home, practically in every room, of what the people loved, apparently. And it's very different from what you find elsewhere in the world. You go to Egypt, you go to Syria, you find uh, the theme was almost always war and conquest. And you go to the island of Thera and you find there are paintings of women gathering saffron. And there are paintings of uh, children playing, boxing with each other. My favorite piece is the dancing antelopes in part because it seems to anticipate Picasso by more than 3,000 years. And these paintings of monkeys reveal a people who even had contact with Africa. 
As on Crete, women wore diaphanous blouses, elegant dresses and hairstyles.